Good morning. I'm Lynn Turvey. My husband John and I have been members of UCE for 15 years. Currently, I'm serving on the interim transition team and the Human Resources Committee. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton's online Zoom service. We are a liberal, multi generational religious community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome a full range of theological perspectives, as well as a full range of spiritual traditions and practices. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we strive to be a community where everyone is able to fully participate. Whether you have been part of our congregation for decades or this is your first time visiting, we welcome you. Whatever the faith and traditions of your past, we welcome you. Whatever your theological stance, we welcome you. Whatever your heritage, we welcome you. Whoever you are and whomever you love, we welcome you, the whole of you. We especially welcome any visitors who might be with us today 
and invite you to join us for conversation in the breakout rooms once the services is ended. We invite you to place your name and contact information in our online guestbook, which you can find on the uce.ca website. We gather today in gratitude on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. As part of that relationship, we are sharing with you the new Indigenous names that have been given to Edmonton's 12 redrawn municipal wards. The names were chosen by a panel of 17 Indigenous women, the Committee of Indigenous Matriarchs, and approved by City Council in December. Today, we share with you Ward 6. The Métis Ward is in East Central Edmonton from the Yellowhead to south of the Sherwood Park Freeway. Métis is a Michif word. The Métis people originated in the early 1700s when French and Scottish fur traders married Indigenous women, such as the Cree and Anishinaabe. After a few generations, the descendants of these marriages formed a distinct culture collective consciousness and nationhood in the Northwest. As the fur trade slowed, Métis people developed farms on river lots close to Fort Edmonton. The shape and position of these lots is a reflection of the city's design. Because of their integral part in the formation of the city, this ward has been given the name Métis to honor a cornerstone in Edmonton's history. Good morning. I'm Reverend Leanne Washington and I'm serving as the Unitarian Church of Edmonton's interim minister. The theme for May is story. On this Mother's Day, Reverend Audrey Brooks, John Sproul and Donna Hamar are going to share with us a short memory of their respective mothers, a memory that they hold dear. Our call to worship this morning comes from Reverend Lisa Bovey Kemper, titled Circle of Care. She writes, In religious community, we share our joys and our triumphs, our sorrows and our broken places. In this circle of care, we make space for the complexity of life, the myriad experiences that bless and break our hearts. The truth of human experience dictates that on any given day, we each come to the table with hearts in different places. It is especially so on this day, invented to honor women who nurture. In this circle of care, we honor the truth that mothering is not and never will be quantified in one single descriptor. Mothering can be elusive or infuriating, fulfilling or confusing, commonplace or triumphant. It exists in the everyday experience of each person. There's no human being that is not connected to or disconnected from a mother. And so we honor the complexity of experience, right? Writ large and flowered platitudes. But here in this space laid bare, we honor the truth in each of our hearts. There is room for all in this circle. If you have carried a child or children, whether or not they came to be born, we see you. If you have fervently wished to do so and circumstances of fate made it impossible, we see you. If you love children we cannot see, whether because of death or estrangement, we see you. If you never wanted to be a mother, we see you. If you are happy to mother other people's children as an educator, an auntie, or a foster parent, we see you. If your mother hurt you, physically or emotionally, we see you. If you had no mother at all, we see you. If your mother is or was your best friend, we see you. If your gender says you are not a mother and yet you take on the role of nurturer, we see you. If you wonder whether your mothering has been enough, we see you. And if yours is a different truth altogether, we honor your unspoken story. There is room for all in this circle. May it be so today and always. Now let us join in worship.
We begin our sacred time together as Unitarian Universalist congregations around the world do by lighting our chalice. As we light our chalice, Alyssa Hudson will share words written by Claudine Oliva for Mothers and Mothering. We light this chalice for mothers and mothering to celebrate those who have taken on the task of nurturing a young one, baby, child, or youth into adulthood, to celebrate those who have nourished the light of truth and compassion in growing minds and hearts, to celebrate those who have committed time, money, energy to the growth of others in this world. We light this chalice to celebrate and hold dear this flame of love. Please enjoy listening to this rendition of hymn number 357, Bright Morning Stars Are Rising, performed by the Oakland Chancel Choir, recording provided by the Church of the Larger Fellowship. An important part of our community is sharing the joys and sorrows of our lives. If you have a personally significant joy or sorrow, please type it into the chat box at the bottom of the screen where we will be able to see it. I will read some of them aloud. Your joys and sorrows will be part of our posted recording of the service. If you would not like to have your joy or sorrow available to the public, then indicate that in the chat with the prefix private. You may also send your joy or sorrow to candles at uce.ca. While you compose your joys and sorrows, please enjoy listening to Dragonfly, composed and performed by Anne Crosby Godet. Thank you. 
Sheila lights a candle of sorrow, thinking about Liz and Clem. Jane lights a candle of remembrance for her mom, who's been gone for 10 years. Maria lights a candle of joy for a five kilometer walk that she took with her sisters yesterday. It's the first time they've been together since Christmas 2019. Karen lights a candle of sorrow, mourning and thanks for her brother-in-law who died last weekend. And she also recognizes that he was thinking of others when he agreed to donate his organs. Lynn lights a candle of concern for those who are in India and who are sick. Maria lights a candle of concern because she's seeking a diagnosis for an invisible disability that's been with her her whole life, unrecognized and unacknowledged. Jan lights a candle of sadness. Karen lights a candle of concern for elderly mothers and grandmothers who cannot be with their families today. Yvonne lights a candle of gratitude for her dear friend, Juliet, who's been her inspiration and has been willing to stand in for her since her mom died when she was young. Kim lights a candle of concern for her son, Michael, who is trying to heal from the lasting effects of COVID-19. Audrey lights a candle of remembrance for her mother who took her and her children in when she came to Edmonton in 1969 to go to university. Logan and Teresa light a candle of remembrance for the mothering spirit from those mothers no longer with us, but always remembered. Alyssa lights a candle of gratitude for her coworker who helped her seven-year-old present her with a Mother's Day gift this year. And her seven-year-old daughter was so proud to give it to Alyssa. Donna lights a candle of sorrow and concern for the days ahead and as she tries to find the strength to face it all. Maida lights a candle to honor her mom and her other mother as she was growing up. Kim lights a candle of remembrance and gratitude for her grandmother who generously loved her and took her family in, which gave them a chance for the future. Coralie and John thank all Unitarians who were so kind to his mom in her last years. Audrey lights a candle of concern and love for Inga Hess, who's in need of more personal care as her physical abilities change. Now I figuratively light a candle for all the joys and sorrows that remain in the sanctuary of our hearts, as well as for those who have not found a spiritual community in which they can share their joys and sorrows. I invite you to join your intentions for healing and co-creating the beloved community to my voice as I share this prayer for Mother's Day written by Reverend John Alou Johnstone. On this day of honoring mothers, we must acknowledge the complexity of the relations in our lives, especially family relations, those most powerful influences. In witness of that power and whatever feelings are awakened in us, let us bring our hearts and minds into focus on the holy and the good, 
Let us be together in the spirit of prayer and meditation. Gracious God, may the spirit of love bless all our families, each of us. Thank you for the mothers who have nurtured our lives and our souls. Thank you for all those who have helped us grow into who we are, whatever their role, grandmother, stepmother, foster parent, or even father or uncle or teacher. We recognize and treasure the nurturers in our own lives, past and present, whoever they may be. Comfort those whose parent or child has died. Loss may feel acute again today as others celebrate. May their grief be muted by the memory of love and the consolation of others. May those with difficult relationships with their mothers or with other parents or with their children find ways to appreciate what has been good and to grow from what has not. May goodness be born from any struggles that exist. We commit ourselves anew to the continuity of the generations, whether we raise children or have raised them ourselves, or whether we seek others to shape the future. May we honor our struggle to offer to all those coming after us the love, the justice, the wisdom, and the guidance that we may be able to give. May the blessings we have been given by previous generations be transmitted again to new generations. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be. With mics muted, please join in singing hymn number 123, Spirit of Life, Spanish first, then English. In this month of storytelling, it is fitting that we hear a few congregants tell us about their mothers and share the ways in which their mothers were role models and dispensers of wisdom. I remind you that just a few weeks ago, we learned about the ancient poem about a powerful, capable, wise, and wealthy woman, the Eshet Chayil. 
You may remember that it was said about her that she opens her mouth with, with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Today, Reverend Audrey Brooks, John Sproul, and Donna Hammer are going to do just that. Rise up and call their mothers blessed and share with us just a few of the blessings that their mothers bestowed on them. Reverend Audrey memories of her mother, Margaret, and the wisdom that she imparted. Wisdom which Reverend Audrey may not have fully appreciated when she was young. Now looking back, <laughs> Reverend Audrey will share with us a short recollection about her mother. The biggest thing that was about my mother was that he, she was a doer uh, as well as a talker, both of which that she could handle very well. We always used to say that mom would go 10 more miles after her heart stopped. She had so much energy. Every day she worked at her job, came home, cooked, sewed, cleaned, and then went to bed about 11 p.m. and slept like a stone. The only day she had off, she would wash clothes, iron them, bake something while she watched TV on Saturday night. And Sundays was always family day with open door to any relative who happened to come by. Since she had 10 brothers and sisters and my dad's family had 12, you can see we were never surprised to see an aunt, uncle or cousins at the door. We circulated among each other's houses for holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas with potluck meals that were like reflections on whatever culture someone married complete with turkeys, moose, pierogies, smoked white fish, dumplings, cabbage rolls, and enough desserts to fill Duchess Bakery. We moved a lot when I was a kid. My dad went where the jobs were. I remember in grade five, I lived in Winnipeg, Steinbach, and Selkirk, Manitoba. So I wrote this kitchen story about mom. Kitchens in many towns, could say they weren't much until my mother turned up. Just walls with tattered curtains, tobacco smoke and dust bunnies. She lit up abandoned spaces by sweeping out old ghosts left behind by other souls. She scrubbed, shone and sewed until houses became homes. The stove was her kitchen god for feasts of Hungarian food like stuffed peppers, noodles, poppy seed rolls, and soups called every traveler to her door. Food was my mother's communion. The kitchen table was her altar. Regardless of family situations, our mother made a safe place out of every kitchen in every town. Now this is a picture of her at 16 when she got her first job in Hudson Bay Junction at a, at a hotel. And from there went on to Flin Flon, Manitoba, where she met my father. And the rest is history. And that was my mother, Margaret Berkner Ishku. She died in 212. John Sproul's mother, Marnie, imparted many lessons upon which John has relied over the years and for which he is grateful. We will now share, he will now share some of the many useful lessons that he learned from his mother. John? Um, and thanks for the opportunity for um, Gordon and, and uh, Reverend uh, Leanne asked me about this. And uh, I could say that both my mom and dad taught me about coming to the Unitarian Church, but that's uh, kind of a given. So I wanted to kind of just provide a two lessons. Uh, this is a picture of mom I took actually at the Trevi Fountain in Rome. She's tossing a coin in. And I picked it because it symbolized being lucky. And that was uh, a direction that both my mom and dad always mentioned to us kids all the time about how lucky we all were. Certainly I remember being in Rome with mom and one thing that was not a good lesson from her was anything about uh, directions uh, geographically, she was absolutely terrible, but she actually was very good at giving you directions in your life. So my big lesson was how lucky we all were, our family, and both, um, it was always glass half full, even when we went through illnesses and or through troubles, it was always with that view of being lucky. 
And even when she went through her kind of final illnesses and stuff, it was always full of strength and a lot of reflection of the great joy that we all had. And I think it came from mom's heritage as a farm girl, where she grew up in northern Alberta, where she always said they didn't have much, but always thought they had plenty. And that was what she felt from her parents. So gratitude for being lucky is lesson one. And the second lesson is stepping up. Um, and mom always taught that you had a duty to step up for others. And most important, you had a duty to step up for yourself. And she led by example, never through anger. One of the most devastating things I can remember she'd say to me after I'd done something stupid was, John, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> Which was, uh, and she would never do it through shame, it was always stepping up through example. And one story, <clears throat> about I remember about stepping up was early in my teens I was taking guitar lessons downtown and had to walk by the uh, mom would always take me down uh and it was by the Cecil Hotel downtown which people remember was pretty rough kind of bar and a big burly bouncer came out right in front of us as we were walking down the street and threw a man into the street just in front of us into the gutter and it was a time where they had separate entrances the male and female entrances and mom said wait here and strode in through the man's entrance after this guy. And I remember she came back and I think she might've been holding him by the arm, but my image in my head is that she was holding him by the ear and dragging him out onto the street. But so that was the image I had and pushed him out saying, that is no way to treat another human being, help this man up. And he would sheepishly go, yes, ma'am. And, and he, had a, he was a big, gigantic athletic guy get him into a cab, yes, ma'am. And I remember she paid for the cab and found out his address and sent mom on his way. And I remember her talking to this man and saying, you never treat another human being like that. And I, I always remember, because this was my mom, I'd never seen her do anything like that before. And she did this always with strangers and with relatives and intervened when people were in trouble. She was the one who went over and stepped up and she changed the path of a lot of people by quietly and sometimes boldly interfering, but only when it mattered. And this was especially a time when people were sick, always dropping food off and going over to check on them. And she told me once, when someone's sick and needs help, you reach out. Don't think, oh, they don't wanna be bothered. Let them tell you that, don't excuse yourself. And she mentioned that, I remember during the, back to the farm during the war, her mom and dad going out to the German families uh, who were ostracized a bit during the war and going out and providing them kind of provisions and checking they were okay. So it might be a family heritage thing about reaching out. So um, a great learning for all of us kids and it's become a moniker or, or a thing that we always say when we're thinking about what we should do is we just have this simple question, what would Marnie do? And following that will lead you down a principled unselfish path. And that's the learning that I have. Although Dana Hummer's mother, Dot, stood only four feet, 11 inches tall and weighed under 100 pounds, her weighty words of wisdom imparted great strength of character to those who would heed them. Donna will now share a lesson that her mother taught her about getting along with our families, which we do not choose, and our friends, which we do. Donna? Donna, you're muted. I guess I thought the, uh, okay. Um, lesson my mother taught me. There were many as all mothers teach. However, I will focus on one. And it was one that turned out to be so important in our very large extended family. While we were growing up, Jan and I had 23 living aunts and uncles, counting spouses, and 47 first cousins, all but five living in Alberta, an actual small area in Alberta. Because our parents were younger members of large families, we also had many second cousins our age, one even being older than us. 
Once when I was critical of one of my particularly irksome aunts, my mother's advice was, and I heed it to this day, you can choose your friends, but not your relatives. So learn to get along with all of them. Now, most were warm, loving and nurturing. Several were very musical, intelligent and accomplished. And almost all were hardworking. Grandparents whom we never knew and seven aunts and uncles were peasant immigrants from what is now the Ukraine. And their English was not so good and their early way of life was, in Canada was pretty poor and simple on the farm, but they were always glad to see us. And then there were some born in this country who were more troublesome or verbose, verbose, either saying nothing or spouting extreme political views, even racist attitudes, or too fond of liquor or drugs, or who made rather poor decisions in the course of their lives. Generally, some people we might not have had much to do with had they not been relatives. A couple even experienced short stays in jail. Another lived in her car for a spell. And another flew his small plane under the Petula Bridge between New Westminster and Vancouver. Um, the latter two uh, hit the Vancouver Sun and uh, Victoria Colonial newspapers. Never dull, but always colorful. However, all were, there was always a deep loyalty and all were accepted at the numerous happy family gatherings, weddings, funerals, anniversaries, festive holidays. Visitations to other communities were frequent where we would stay not in hotels, but in their homes or were fed meals. Likewise in our home. Every summer, it seemed we had some cousin come and live um, with us so that they could work in Hammer's grocery store. Welcome was very much a family motto and we all learned to accept and extend hospitality graciously. For example, mom's lesson really benefited me when I was off on my own to Vancouver for university. I did not know a soul and would be there for two years. Well, the distant, rather dysfunctional family reached out and many a weekend invited me to dinners, tea and taro readings, introducing me to the um, varied members of that branch of the family. And I enjoyed them. I enjoyed their quirkiness their love of life that was so different than mine, which was to be cautious, to plan for the future, sacrifice and save, and certainly don't be outrageous or heaven forbid, scandalous. To this day, I'm one of the members of my large extended family that continues to keep in friendly touch with almost every one of them or at least those that are still around. Thank you, mom. It was a very valuable lesson. Well, we thank all of you for sharing your precious memories with us. While I have a good relationship with my mother, it was from my paternal grandmother that I learned what unconditional love really means. Mm -hmm. She used to frequently say to us, I may not approve of your choices or your actions, but there's nothing you can say or do that would ever change my love for you. I am always on your side. I remembered her words as I was choosing the next hymn and read the universalist message found in the first stanza, which begins with the words, no matter if you live now far or near, no matter what your weakness or your strength, there is not one alive we count outside. 
With mics muted, please join in singing hymn number 181, no matter if you live now far or near. Generosity is a spiritual practice, one that enlarges the heart, enlightens the spirit. For no matter how much or how little we have, in the sharing of it, both the one who gives and the one who receives are blessed. We are a self-governing and self-supporting community. We rely on your donations to support our staff and to offer our programs. Now, more than ever, we need your financial support. Please visit our website at uce.ca and click on donate in the upper left corner to find the donation method that best suits you. For the month of May, we encourage you to also support the Youth Empowerment and Support Services. Yes, please visit their website for more information about them. You'll find a link to, the, to them on our church homepage at uce.ca. With mics muted, please join in singing hymn number 402 from You I Receive. As we bring our time together to a close, I want to make sure that we express our gratitude for all those who have helped make our time together today possible. We thank Ruth Marriott, who created and ran our slides today, and who will be posting the recording of today's service on YouTube and SoundCloud. We thank Lynn Turvey and Alyssa Hudson, our readers, Lynn Wolf, who is recording today's service, and Karen Bolita, who opened our Zoom room for the service, greeted everyone, and is managing our breakout rooms. From time immemorial, long before the Abrahamic religions, most of the world's religions reflected a balance between the feminine and masculine forces in the world. In an attempt to redress the imbalance that currently exists in the dominant culture in which we live, I share with you a poem written by Alison Woodard titled, God, Our Mother. To be a mother is to suffer, to travail in the dark, stretched and torn, exposed in half-naked humiliation, subjected to indignities for the sake of new life. To be a mother is to say, this is my body broken for you. And in the next instant in response to the created's primal hunger, this is my body, take and eat. 
To be a mother is to self empty, to neither slumber nor sleep, so attuned you are to cries in the night. Offering the comfort of yourself and assurances of, I'm here. To be a mother is to weep over the fighting and exclusions and wounds your children inflict on one another. To long for reconciliation and brotherly love and when all is said and done, to gather all parties, the offender and the offended, into the folds of your embrace and to whisper in their ears that they are beloved. To be a mother is to be vulnerable, to be misunderstood, railed against, blamed for the heartaches of the bewildered children who don't know where else to cast the angst they feel over their own existence in this perplexing universe. To be a mother is to hoist unto your hips those on whom your image is imprinted, bearing the burden of their weight, rejoicing in their returned affection, delighting in their wonder, bleeding in the presence of their pain. To be a mother is to be accused of sentimentality one moment and injustice the next. To be the receiver of endless demands, absorber of perpetual complaints, reckoner of bottomless needs. To be a mother is to be an artist, a keeper of memories past, weaver of stories untold, visionary of lies, lives looming ahead. To be a mother is to be the first voice listened to and the first disregarded. To be a mender of broken creations and comforter of the distraught children whose hands wrought them. To be a mother is to be a touchstone and the source, bestower of names, influencer of identities, light giver, life shaper, empath, healer, and original love. We close our sacred time together by extinguishing our chalice. As we do, Alyssa Hudson will share with us the words of Deborah Burrell titled, Kendall New Sparks. We have basked in the warmth and beauty of this flame and this community. As the chalice flame is extinguished, let us carry its glow within let us kindle new sparks within these walls and beyond. Let us also join in singing hymn number eight, Mother Spirit, Father Spirit by the First UU Church of Oakland. Lynn, you may be muted. I mean, um, I can't seem to get the get the the uh, sound going on this hymn. Sorry. That's quite all right. We have another hymn that we can sing as we close our service. Carry the flame.
This concludes our worship service this morning. Please feel free to take a short comfort break, get a cup of coffee, and watch our weekly announcements as they slide by. In a few minutes, you'll be invited into randomly assigned breakout rooms for conversation and the coffee in your cup. You may accept the invitation to join a breakout room, you may decline the invitation, or you may accept the invitation, and then when you're ready, return to the main room. I will remain in the main room for about an hour for questions about the service and general discussion.